him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want us all to say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Last year, the number one motion picture in the United States and I suppose throughout the world that drew the largest box office was a motion picture that was made just for a small amount of money. Nobody ever thought it would amount to much. It was based upon a simple little story, and it was called Love Story. And then last year, the Duke of Windsor died, and a headline in the British papers said, the greatest love story of the century. But the greatest love story of all time is summed up in these 25 verses of 25 words that someone is called a miniature Bible, the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest love story ever told. For God. Do you ever stop and think about God? Many people are thinking about God today because we've seen that science does not have an answer to all of our problems. We are seeing that technology cannot solve all of our problems. And so thousands of young people in Europe and in America are beginning to talk about God. Some of them are going to India to see if they can find peace in their hearts. Some of them are going and studying yoga and they're going into all sorts of different sects and groups searching for God. Some of them are going out into the desert and sitting under the stars and watching the stars. Have you ever wondered about God? Someone asked me at a university one day, can you prove God exists? And I answered no. I cannot put God in a test tube. I cannot put God in a laboratory and say, here's God. How do I know that God exists? All the evidence seems to indicate that he does. I look up in the starry sky and I say, there must be a God. I look at the beautiful nature round about me and I say, there must be a God. I see the birth of a baby. Gary Player was telling us yesterday how he saw the birth of his last child. And he said, as I watched that, I knew that there had to be a God. But there's another reason. Deep in your heart, you have a conscience. And your conscience tells you there must be a God. Something down inside tells me there must be a God. And the Bible tells us that this God is the creator of all the universe. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now in that passage in Genesis 1, there is no explanation. There's no attempt to prove God. It just says, in the beginning, God. Because everybody believes in God. Oh, but you say, I've met some atheists. You met some atheists that hadn't had any real trouble yet. But you find a person who claims he's an atheist and let someone announce to him that he has terminal cancer and you'll say, my God, help me. Or he get into a battle or get into a difficult spot, he'll say, my God, help me. I remember Mr. Khrushchev was touring the United States. And of course, being the head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, he didn't believe in God. But one day he let slip several things. He quoted several passages of scripture and he called them old Russian sayings. And then he said, may God have mercy upon me. Then he caught himself and he said, of course, I don't believe in God. But you see, down inside, something in Mr. Khrushchev was saying, you believe in God. Yes, all men know that there must be a God. He is the creator. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Now the Bible tells us God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body like yours. If God had a body like yours, he would have to be in one place at one time. But God doesn't have a body like yours. God is a spirit. And God can be in Africa, he can be in Asia, he can be in Europe, 
He can be in America all at the same time. He can be on a planet. He can be on the moon at the same time. I've talked to some of those astronauts that went to the moon and they told me that they knew as they went around the moon, there must be a God. I talked to some of the prisoners of war from Vietnam just a few days before I came on this trip. I talked to those first prisoners that came back to the United States and they told us in those prison cells for eight years in Vietnam, they knew there was a God. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us that God is unchanging. He never changes. Fashions change. Every part of our culture and life changes. And vast changes are underway throughout the world. And South Africa is finding that she can no longer live isolated from the rest of the world. Neither can we in America. And the great problems that we face are under tremendous pressure from world public opinion. The jet plane, modern communications have made it impossible. Fashions change, culture changes, technology changes, but God never changes. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says, there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning with God. God has not changed in thousands of years. 10,000 times 10,000 years from now, God will be the same. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God does not change. The Bible also tells us that God is a holy God. Absolutely holy. The Bible says thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Thou canst not look on iniquity. God is holy and righteous. And you'll never understand God. You'll never understand about God and God's dealing with us until you understand that God is absolutely pure and God is absolutely holy and God cannot even look upon sin with any approval whatsoever. And then the Bible tells us that God is a God of judgment. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, the Bible says, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's a judgment day coming. You're going to be there if you're outside of Christ. And every secret thing will be brought to light. Everything that you hid, everything that you did that you didn't think anybody knew about, all of your thoughts, all of your motives, all of your intents, all of your actions are on God's computers. And God is keeping a record. And someday, you're going to have to stand before a holy God and give an account at the great judgment day. Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. The apostle Paul said in his great sermon at Athens, he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Christ Jesus. There's a day of judgment coming. He has appointed a day. It's all set. You're going to be there. And every secret thing that you've ever thought or done will be flashed on the scoreboards up in heaven at the judgment. And the whole world will see what you really were down inside. God is a God of judgment. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. That God loves I'm glad that's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And that God loves everybody. I don't care who you are. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He's interested in you. And he loves you. Now there are several Greek words that are translated love. Eros means sensual love, sexual love. Phileo means friendship love, the love that I would have for a friend. But when the writers of the New Testament were trying to find a word that would describe the love of God, they invented a new word, agape, the divine love, a love that we cannot know outside of God. There is no love that you can think of in human relationships comparable to the love that God has for you and that God has for me. God loves you. You say, but Billy, I don't deserve such love. I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I failed him a thousand times. I know the 
That's the beauty and the greatness and the thrill of God's love. That no matter what you've done, He loves you. For God so loved the world, the black world, the white world, the yellow world, the red world, the rich world, the poor world, the uneducated world, the educated world. And He loves us all the same. God loves you. And God loved us so much that he gave his son. Now, why did he have to give his son? What happened? What tragedy? What disaster came upon the human race? The Bible tells us that God created you, created man. He put him in paradise. He put him in utopia. And God gave to man a gift he did not give to his other creatures. God created us in his image, not in the physical image of God, but in the spiritual image. We have a moral nature and we have the right to choose. And God said, I'm going to give you everything in the world for your happiness. But there's one tree over here that I don't want you to touch because I've given you the freedom of choice. I want you to choose me because you want to. I want you to love me and serve me because you want to serve me. You want to love me. I don't want you to do it because I make you. I've given you the tremendous responsibility of freedom of choice. So I put a tree here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt die. What happened? Man looked at the tree. He looked at the fruit. He saw it was an unusual fruit. Probably had a magnificent taste. The devil was there in the form of a serpent to tempt him. And the Bible says that man broke the law of God. Man rebelled against God. Man failed the test. And man made his own deliberate choice. God said in the day that you eat it, in the day that you rebel against me, in the day that you break this law of the Garden of Eden, you shall die. God had to keep his word. Man had to die or God would not be holy. So from that moment on, man began to die. He died physically, he died spiritually, he died eternally. And all the troubles and all the problems of the world down through history have come from that great disaster because all of us are the sons of Adam. All of our prejudices, all of our hates, all of our fightings, all of our bickerings, all of our jealousies, all of our pride, everything that troubles the human race today came from the fact that we have rebelled against God and we're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. You have sinned. I have sinned. We are guilty. Pascal once said, in seeking to become angels, we have become less than men. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, once said, it is becoming more and more obvious that our problems are not social. He said it's not starvation, it's not cancer, but man himself who is mankind's greatest danger. Bertrand Russell once said, it is in our hearts that the evil lies. It's in our hearts. That's what Jesus taught, that our problems lie in our hearts because Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Jesus said, your problem is a heart problem. The Apostle Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's a mystery about it. None of us really knows exactly where the devil came from. I'm writing a book right now on the devil. I've been doing a lot of research for 18 months on the subject. We don't know for sure exactly how the devil came, but we know that he's a factor. We know that he is there tempting and pulling and trying us and attacking us and harassing us at every turn. And we know that mankind made the fateful choice in Adam 
to follow the devil instead of God. But the Bible says in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sins, God loves us. And God gave his only son. Now the Bible says the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Well, you go out here and you see the cemeteries and you know that people die physically. Yes, we're all going to die. In a hundred years, every person in this audience will be dead. Perhaps in 50 years, we'll all be dead. Everybody will be dead. I'm 54 years of age. The most of my life has already been lived. I know that I'm going to die unless Christ comes first. I know that I'm going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. That's a result of sin that has infected the whole human race. Then there's spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Well, spiritual death is where you are alive in a sense, but you're also dead. And that's why you find movie stars who reach the top, the sex symbols like Marilyn Monroe. Many of them commit suicide. Many of them are unhappy. Why? Because they thought that if they had power and fame and money, they'd be happy, but they're not happy. Why? Because spiritually, your soul made in the image of God is separated from God, and your soul keeps crying out for God. And you say, well, if I make a little more money, maybe my soul will be happy. Or if I get a little more power, or if I have a little more influence, I'll be happy. But the trouble is, you're not happy. You see, you want more. And you don't get that certain something that you're always looking for. It's always elusive. It's always out there in the future somewhere. Why? Because your soul is searching for God. And your soul made in the image of God says, I want God. And St. Augustine said, it's restless till it finds God. And until you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive him into your heart, you'll always be questing and looking and trying to find, but you won't be able to find. Then there's a third death, and that's called eternal death. That's what Jesus called hell. He used the word lost, perish, condemn, hell, punishment. Whatever it is, it is separation from God because of our sins. And the Bible indicates that Jesus believed that there was a future world, there was a future heaven, and a future hell. Now in the midst of all that, God says, I love man so much, I want to save him. So what did God do? God devised a magnificent plan to redeem you, to save you. He decided to come to earth and to become a man. And that's who Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ did not have a human father. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Mary couldn't have been more than about 16 or 17 years of age. And she became pregnant not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. And she gave birth to a baby. And that baby grew up and he began to teach. And what a person he was. He was only able to teach and heal and feed people for three years. And they crucified him. The Romans took him outside the city walls of Jerusalem. They beat him until his back bled. They put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face bled. They pulled his beard out. They put spikes in his hands. And while they were doing that, 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and sweep this planet into hell. And Jesus said, no, I love them too much. I will bear the hell. I will bear the judgment on the cross for their sins. And Jesus Christ hung there between heaven and earth and in some mysterious way that I do not understand. God took your sins and your sins and your sins and my sins and laid them on Christ. And in that dreadful moment, we get a glimpse of what was happening because our Lord exclaimed, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible agonizing moment, he was bearing your sins and my sins. 
He took the death and the hell and the judgment and the sin that I deserved. He took on that cross. The Bible says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah the prophet had prophesied, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul said, you have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was made sin. Jesus Christ became guilty of adultery, of murder, of robbery, of hate, of prejudice. On that cross, he took our sins. He who had never known a sin took our sins and became sin. He became sin for us. And they took his body away and laid him in a grave. But it didn't stay there. The Bible says on the third day, he arose again. And Jesus Christ at this moment is alive. Right now, he's a living savior. And when they went out to see his body, the angel said, he is not here, for he is risen. And the greatest words that were ever given in the language of men was, he is not here, he is risen. Jesus is alive right now. And he's ready to come into your heart and receive you and receive you into him self so that he will abide in you and you will abide in him if you put your faith and your trust and your confidence in him now that's not the end of the story because god has another plan god's plan is to send jesus christ back to this earth again when is it going to take place we don't know but i believe that there are signs in the scriptures that would indicate that his coming is relatively soon it may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from now. We do not know. But we know that the Bible is filled with passages that indicate that he's coming back. And we are going to have utopia. We are going to have world peace. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. Justice will sweep the earth. And there's coming a day when the dream that Martin Luther King gave in Washington will come true when all prejudice will be gone and men will have love for each other. But till that time, we are called upon to do the best we can dealing with fallen human nature. We can patch up problems here and patch up problems there and patch up problems everywhere. And we spend all of our time patching up problems. And now we have atomic bombs in our hands ready to throw at each other. But Jesus is coming back. And the next time he comes, it will be as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I'm looking forward to hearing that shout. I get tired sometimes and I get weary. And I sometimes say, Lord, I wish you were today. Sometimes the pressures are too great and sometimes the burdens of life are too great. And I find myself praying in the middle of the night, Lord, let it be at sunrise tomorrow. I'm ready to go. I want to go. I'm looking forward to heaven. And I'm living in hope and anticipation of that glorious tomorrow in which there'll be no sunset and no darkness. And the streets will be paved with gold. And the fruit trees will bear 12 crops a year. And everybody will have plenty to eat and there'll be no poverty in the world. What a wonderful time that's going to be. But now at this moment in this stadium and on this radio, God the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. The gospel is never preached without the working and the operation of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a little voice that's been speaking to you while I'm speaking. That's the voice of the Spirit of God. And God has been convicting you of your sin and God has been convicting you of your need of Jesus Christ. Oh, I know that the majority of you may be members of the church. When I came to Christ many years ago, I was a member of the church. I was the president of the Young People's Society in my church. Everybody thought I was a wonderful Christian. But deep in my heart, I did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, God loves you. He's given his son. What do you have to do? You have to do something. What is it? First, you have to repent of your sin. Jesus said, repent ye. The Apostle Paul said, God now commanded 
all men everywhere to repent. God commands you to repent. Have you ever repented of your sin? Do you remember the moment when you repented? You say, well, Billy, what do you really mean by repent? Well, first of all, repentance carries with it the idea that you say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Have you ever said that to God? I'm sorry, and you really meant it? And then it means that you have to change. You have to turn around. You have to change and quit doing your sins. Change your way of living. Old things pass away, and everything becomes new. That's repentance. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. Have you ever repented? Jesus said, except you repent, you will perish. And then secondly, by faith, you must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That can all be done with repentance. Repentance and faith go hand in hand. You may not understand it all intellectually. You don't have to. You come by simple childlike faith. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, that doesn't mean you do away with your intellect or commit intellectual suicide. Oh, no, there's a logic to the gospel. But your mind has been affected by sin so that you can no longer really receive spiritual things. So you come by faith and receive him. And then the third thing, you must openly confess him as your Lord and Savior and Master. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Now that's why I ask people to come forward in these crusades. I ask you to openly confess Christ. All over the world, throughout Japan, throughout America, in the great stadiums of Great Britain and all over Europe, I've seen thousands of people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat wherever you are, and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I know that I'm a sinner. I receive Christ into my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want a new life in Jesus Christ. You say, Billy, that's a hard thing for me to do, to get up and come in front of everybody. I know. But Jesus hung on that cross in front of a shouting crowd that was spitting at him and laughing at him and mocking him. He died publicly, and not a single place in the New Testament do you find that Jesus ever called anybody privately. It's always publicly that he called them. And there's a reason for that. A psychological reason, a spiritual reason, a scriptural reason. You say, but how would I ever get through this crowd? I know it's going to be difficult, so I'm going to ask the crowd to help us. I'm going to ask you not to move where you are. Just stay where you are, quiet, reverent, with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask men and women and young people to get up and come and stand in front of the platform and back of the platform here and all around. Just stand here. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some verses of scripture and some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or in a coach, they'll wait on you. You say, well, why is that important? When I got married, I stood in front of witnesses and said, I will. Coming to Christ is in something the same way. You're making a covenant with God to receive Christ into your heart and to receive God's love and forgiveness. And you do it openly and you say, Lord, I will. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter and the 31st verse. Deuteronomy, that's in the Old Testament. Over toward the beginning of the Old Testament, in what is called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And there's a verse tucked away in Moses' farewell address to ancient Israel that says this in the 31st verse. It says this, For their rock is not our rock. For their rock is not our rock. In the latter part of the last century, a man toured America and Great Britain, and many times he used that text 
I'd never noticed that text until I read one of his sermons a few weeks ago. D.L. Moody, their rock is not our rock. Moses is now an old man. He has led the children of Israel for 40 years in the desert. He's been a king, a father, a president, a leader all these years. And now only Joshua and Caleb are left. All the other generation are dead. And all the people standing out before him are young people. Young people just like you, with the same desires, the same aspirations, the same longings, the same dreams, the same problems, the same sins, the same temptations that you have. And Moses, looking upon this vast audience, an entirely new generation with his long white beard preaching to them, warning them, warning them of other gods and false gods that are going to come up to take the place of the true and the living God. And he said, if you follow these false gods, the judgment of God will come upon you. And he referred to God as a rock. And he referred to these other gods as rocks spelled with a little R. The rock god was spelled with a capital R. Now, why did he use the term rocks as an illustration? The children of Israel had been wandering around among the rocks for 40 years. They knew what a rock was. They knew the hard rocks and the soft rocks and all kinds of rocks. And he said, their rock is not our rock. What are some of the rocks in America right now that young people are in danger? You know, I talked to a man just a few weeks ago who claimed to be an atheist. I don't know whether he was really an atheist, but he said he was an atheist. He said, I've been an atheist all my life. He said, my father was an atheist. He said, I am now 71 years of age. And I said, what do you have to look forward to? He said, nothing. He said, life has been miserable for me. Well, I said, why don't you give up your atheism? Why don't you believe in God? He said, my pride won't let me. Their rock is not our rock. Compared with Paul, the Apostle Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. What a contrast between an atheist and a believer. One man was facing death fearful, empty, the other man was facing death full of confidence. Their rock is not our rock. Secondly, young people, many young people are going after materialism. They've fallen for the materialistic God that says things are more important than anything else. I find across the country today a deep economic discontent among people. I find it in Europe. I find it around the world. And people are wanting more and more things. And we forget that we have the highest standard of living the world has ever known. We still have poverty. The government is trying to do something about it. The church is trying to do something. Hundreds of social agencies are trying to do something about it. But the people that we call living in poverty would be considered rich if they lived in Bangladesh or in many other parts of the world. We're a rich nation. But still, with all of our riches, we're dissatisfied. We want more, 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 more. The more we get, the more we want. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. He said, a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. A famous man was quoted in the paper the other day as saying, I'm worth millions of dollars, but I can tell you this, that's not where it's at. I'm worth millions, 
But that's not where it's at. Adolf Burl, in his study of power, points out riches make people solitary, lonely, and often afraid. Many times a rich man has a loneliness and a fear. Because you see, if you make riches your God, if you make things your God, if you make money your God, it leaves you empty. George Bernard Shaw said, there are two tragedies in life. One is not to get your heart's desire, and the other is to get it. You think if you had a lot of money, you'd be happy. Some of you have already got a lot, and you're not happy. Two tragedies. You didn't get it, and you did get it. You see, without God, life loses its zest and its purpose and its meaning, even though you may have money. Young people in America today are revolting against affluency. And yet today, many young people are prisoners of a culture which puts a premium on things rather than moral values. Their rock is not our rock. Don't make money your God. There's nothing wrong with having money if you got it legitimately and honestly. It's what you do with it. It's your attitude toward it. Do you love it? Has it become your God? Does it dominate you? Does it have such a hold on you that you don't have time for God? Their rock is not our rock. That's not the rock we want. And then thirdly, their aims and objectives are not our rock. What are the objectives of the average person in America today? Power, pleasure, leisure, money. What is the objective of a Christian? To glorify God, to live for God, to do the will of God, to love your neighbor, to help your neighbor to make an impact in society for God and to leave the world a little better place because you were here. What is your objective? Is your objective to get all the leisure time you can, to have all the pleasure you can have, to make all the money you can make? What is your objective? What's your goal in life? Where are you headed? Their rock is not our rock. And then fourthly, there's pleasure. You know, in America today, we're searching for new thrills. We've worn out the old amusements. You're not to become so absorbed. The Bible says be temperate in all things. There are legitimate pleasures that can take most of your time and occupy most of your thinking that are legitimate in themselves, but they soon become sin because they've taken the place of God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore, said the psalmist. Do you have that kind of pleasure? The kind of pleasure that's not dependent on circumstances? The kind of pleasure that's not dependent on how you feel? The kind of pleasure that runs deep, that has been brought there by the Spirit of God? When the tide comes in, the rock of pleasure will turn into a sand. The sweetness of pleasure turns to bitterness and disappointment. Life becomes empty, sick, and a tragic thing. When pleasure is put first and becomes your God, their rock is not our rock. There's the rock of revolution. All over the country we hear the word revolution. And many young people have fixed their hope and their dreams on change in the political system. And they believe that if they can get this revolution, it'll fix everything. I was with one of these young leaders whose name is known to many of you in New York some time ago. And I looked out across Manhattan. He said, we're going to burn it down. I said, what are you going to rebuild in its place? He said, we haven't gotten that far. I said, well, before you destroy the American ship, you better be sure that you can know how to build a raft. Many people have an idea that they, I think they, it's the excitement of revolution for revolution's sake. 
You know, every utopia has turned out to be a pipe dream in the history of the human race. Their rock is not our rock. Yes, we need change in America. But let's keep our freedom. Let's don't have a revolution just for revolution's sake, or we will destroy everything that's been built in the greatest nation in the history of the world. Seventhly, religiosity can become a god. You know, there's a great emphasis today on the occult. I was asked about it on television today in an interview. Satan worship. People today that are going after all kinds of false spirits across the country and in Europe and in the Far East as well. It's become a big thing and a big business. And many young people across the country are being fooled by all kinds of cults and spirits and devils and demons. Beware. You're dealing with the dark powers that are very real. How did Jesus overcome the devil? By arguing? No. By debating? No. He quoted scripture. The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was walking according to the will of God. And he quoted the Bible. And every time he quoted the Bible, the devil was defeated. That's the reason it's important to memorize scripture. Study the Bible. And I'm so anxious that young people across America now that are finding Christ by the thousands will get into the Scriptures, get into the Word of God. Learn it. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. Because if you don't, we're going to have a backlash in the next generation. And young people who have had an experience with Christ and don't become taught in the Scriptures are prime targets for the devil. Get into the Scriptures. Get to work for Christ. Their rock is not our rock. Eighthly, their cure is not our cure. That's one of the problems of psychiatry. I'm for psychiatrists and psychologists. I send many people to them. But there's a point beyond which a psychiatrist who is not a, a believer, there's a point beyond which he can't help. In many cases, he has no cure. And many of them have admitted this to me privately. And some of them are beginning to do it publicly, and they're doing it in books now. You see, the cure of the world the Freudian cure is one direction, but the Christian cure is another. The Christian cure is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cure for domestic problems. There's a father having problems with a son. What is the cure? The son in rebellion? The son going out on his own, seeking his own identity, doing things that appalls the father. The father becomes angry. The parents become upset. There is a Christian cure. The cure is Christ to go to our knees. And you know, I love the young people of this generation. I can see why a lot of them have rebelled. They have rebelled against the hypocrisies they've seen in us. They've seen us tell lies. They've heard us tell them not to smoke their pot and seen us drink our alcohol. They've heard us use those swear words. They've seen father and mother flirting with the next door neighbor. They've seen the sharp business deals that they knew were not right. They've seen the emphasis has been on things even while you went to church on Sunday, yet the whole emphasis of your life is materialistic. They've seen the hypocrisy, and they said, we don't want it. 
But let me tell you this, you young people, if you'd lived a few years ago, your life expectancy wouldn't have been very long because, you see, this generation was able to make some breakthroughs in medicine and in science that has given you all these marvelous drugs so you don't have to worry today about smallpox and polio and all of these other things that preoccupied people a generation or two ago and sent terror and fear through this community of Charlotte many times through disease. There are many wonderful things that this generation has brought. Television, radio, brought the world into our living room. And this generation of people, my generation, worked hard. We came through the Depression. We didn't want you to ever have to go through a depression again. We came through World War II and we determined that we were going to do all we could to keep out of another great world war. And you young people must understand that this generation has done some good things, even though we've done some bad things. And we want to help you as we hand the torch to you we want to help you change it and make it better. But we've got to, in all fairness, say that the problem lies deeper than we thought. The problem lies in the human heart. We found that we cannot legislate morals. We found we cannot pass a law and settle a race problem. We can help, but that doesn't solve it all. It's got to come from the human heart. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Their rock is not our rock. Their cure is not our cure. Our cure says you must be born again. Now what is this rock that is ours with the big capital R? The rock is God and the Bible tells us that the rock in the Old Testament was actually Jesus Christ. He was the rock, King of kings and Lord of lords, born of the Virgin Mary, died on the cross for our sins, rose again for our justification. He is the rock that we're to put our confidence and our faith in, and he's called in the Bible the rock of defense. When we put our trust in him, he takes our side, he takes our part, he helps us carry the load. And when you come to Jesus Christ as Savior, you don't have to... You don't have to live a life by yourself. You can't live the Christian life alone. Christ will be there. He is the rock that will help you to live the life. If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm glad that my defense at the great judgment of God is going to be in the hands of the greatest lawyer in the universe, Jesus Christ, our advocate. And the devil is going to say, look at Billy Graham. Ha <laughs> ha. Look at the sins he committed. Look at the things he did that are wrong. Jesus Christ is going to step, step up and be my representative. And he's never lost a case. And then he is a high rock, the Bible says, a watchtower. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Did you know that the Christian has a vantage point that the world doesn't have? Everybody's wringing their hands and saying, what's happening in the world? What's wrong with the world? Why is the world in such a mess? I can tell you. The simplest Christian in this audience tonight with no education at all can tell you exactly what's wrong with the world. Because the Christian has an insight that nobody else has. The Christian can tell you what's wrong with the world and the Christian can tell you what could put the world right. Because you see, we have a rock a vantage point. Then the Bible teaches that our rock is a refuge. The Bible speaks of the cleft in the rock, a hiding place from the storms of life, a place where we can go and pray and meditate and think and worship God. Rock is a foundation, for other foundation can no man lay than that was laid in Christ Jesus. Is Jesus Christ the foundation of your life? There were two men that Jesus told about. One built his house on the sand, one built it on the rock. The storm came, and the one that was built on the sand crumbled 
and the one that was built on the rock lasted. Where are you building your life? Is it on the rock? Or is it on a false rock? A sandy rock that will crumble and erode? A shaly rock? Oh, there are some things that are eternal in our rock. The Bible says God is eternal. The eternal God is thy refuge. The Bible says that spiritual truth is eternal. The Bible says that God gives us eternal life. The Bible tells us that heaven is eternal. The Bible says God's judgment is eternal. He is an eternal rock. The Bible says prepare to meet thy God. The Bible says, if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. Even his enemies recognize that their rock is not our rock. Paul says of the rock in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock was Christ. Other rocks crumble and slide and erode and fall but not Christ. Is he your rock? Is he your Lord and your master and your savior? Have you surrendered everything to him without reservation? You can tonight. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing to turn from your sins. You have to be willing to receive him as your Lord and your master and your savior. And you have to be willing to do it publicly. Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me openly and publicly, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's no such thing as secret discipleship. You come publicly. That's why I ask people to come forward. To receive Christ openly. That's part of it. It's an open acknowledgement that he is your rock. But I want to tell you what I said across Japan and India and across Africa. When you come to Jesus Christ and make him your rock with a capital R, you must turn from the other rock. And it will cost you something because some of the rocks in your life are wrong. Will you make Jesus Christ your rock of Gibraltar and stake your eternal destiny on him? I'm asking you to do that tonight and I'm asking hundreds of young people to make him their rock tonight and go out of here saying from this hour on I'm going to follow him and serve him and I'm going to help change the world for Christ. That's the revolution we need.